Good evening. Welcome to the Gospel Meeting here in the Newington Gospel Hall. Weather-wise, it has been a wonderful week here in the Constitution State. I can't imagine a better thing to do at the end of the work week than tell you about the Lord Jesus, and I can't imagine a better thing for you to do at the end of the work week than to hear this message and trust the Lord Jesus. The Christians who meet here have been preaching the gospel throughout this area for almost a century, and they're delighted you could join us tonight. These meetings continue, God willing, next week, Sunday to Friday, again at 7 p.m. We're going to ask for God's blessing, shall we pray? Father, in the name of thy beloved Son, the Lord Jesus, we bow together in thy presence. We thank thee that we can tell men and women of a Savior who loves them and died for them. We thank thee for the message of the gospel. There would be no good news to proclaim if Christ Jesus had not come into the world to save sinners. So we thank thee that he came. We thank thee that he died. We thank thee that he rose and that he lives in the power of an indissoluble life. And we ask for thy rich blessing on his gospel as we proclaim it this evening, giving thanks in the Savior's precious name. Amen. I want to read to you the statement of the Lord Jesus when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. I want to consider with you in the next two nights as well as tonight an answer to the very important question, does God have a plan for this world? If you were walking down the street and saw a car coming over the hill and careering toward you, obviously out of control, you would know that evasive action was necessary. It would do little good to say to yourself, I will go to the right or I will go to the left, since the car's actions would be unpredictable. You'd have to do your best to dodge the car and hope you could escape harm. Its unpredictability, along with the lack of a hand to guide it, would make it an all the more dangerous situation. I think that many people view the world's history that way. They feel it is unguided, that it is unpredictable, capricious, and, and haphazard. But people are vaguely aware of the saying, history repeats itself without knowing how or why it happens. Thankfully, the Bible supplies us with insight as to where we are going, why things are the way they are. So please follow me as we consider these two realities tonight. There is a malevolent power pushing the world toward its destruction. And there is an almighty power planning to deliver the world from its misery. That malevolent power was identified by the Lord Jesus as the prince of this world. Paul calls him the prince of the power of the air. As someone has written, and I think these are memorable words, quote, in the Garden of Eden, Adam's choice to disobey a divine command introduced the moral battle of the heavenlies into the earthly arena with consequences that will reach to the end of history. The original sin in the Garden of Eden has affected all of humanity so that every human being is born into a state of alienation from God. End of quote. Having captured the king and queen of Eden, Satan has continued his foolish battle against God from then till now. Here are some of what we know about Satan's awful plan. First of all, he's looking for a man. It would seem that the devil has always had a man in the wings whom he would move onto center stage and onto the throne of the world if God allowed him. It may be that the man whom he will eventually use is training right now in some military academy in the world, or earning his degree in a university, or leading some small and insignificant kingdom somewhere in the world. At present, he may be nothing more than the potentate of some petty pumpernickel state, as Churchill used the term. In a coming day, perhaps very soon, the devil will take up that man and will infuse him with incredible charisma, ability, and power. He will place this man on the throne of a global empire, and he will challenge God to remove him. I was struck once by reading the comment of a European politician and a former secretary general of NATO who is reported to have said, 
We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man, a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or devil, we will receive him. Sadly, the devil is going to send them such a man, and he will be a beastly, blasphemous, brutal, murderous man. The devil is waiting for the moment when he can do this. If the devil has always been ready to initiate this open challenge to God, why has he not done so already? The answer to that is that Christians are still here, still preaching the gospel of the grace of God and a patient, long-suffering God who is not willing that any should perish is extending his offer of salvation based on his rich grace. Because believers in this age are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, that means that a divine person has lived, not merely visited, but lived here in this world since the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. When all the believers are removed, the Holy Spirit will still be in the world, but it will be as it was in Old Testament times. He will not be permanently dwelling here or indwelling those who are believers. This compels the devil to have to wait for the moment when he will be able to carry out his plan. Think of a huge, fully loaded 18-wheeler coming down a steep mountain and suddenly having no brakes. The activity of the Holy Spirit of God through Christians and gospel preaching has been a break on all that Satan has longed to do. At the rapture, when the Christians are taken home, the brakes will be gone, and the velocity with which events will move to their cataclysmic culmination will increase horribly, dramatically, and rapidly. And one more thing. The devil has been shaping the mentality of men and women. It may be that moral people, sane-thinking people, would revolt against much of what the devil plans in a coming day because he will exploit mankind for his own evil purposes. So it requires much propaganda and mental manipulation to prepare human beings to accept the devil's blueprint and receive his false god and false messiah. So we are being inched closer and closer to a situation and increasingly immersed in a climate that will make the world more susceptible to accepting what the devil intends. Of course, his nefarious plan will have a veneer of propriety and practicality. The push for a one-world government, the destruction of national borders, the longing for a virtual currency or some other means of making uh, purchases other than paper money, the, the hunger for someone who can bring peace to a, a war-torn world, the renunciation of biblical principles and morals, the removal of God from the public arena. All these and so much more fall into line with what the Bible says will mark the end times towards which we seem to be heading with blinding speed. So I'm so thankful to tell you that there is an almighty power planning to deliver this planet, our world, from its misery. I think I could say there are three parts to the total victory that the Lord Jesus will have. We'll consider one of them tonight and spend the next two meeting nights, that would be Sunday and Monday, on the second and third parts, if the Lord will. The first is Calvary. Calvary and the cross of Christ. The second that we will look at will be the coming of the Lord for his people and the events that will follow that. And the third is the crowning of the Lord Jesus as King of Kings and what our world would be like when, will be like when finally the right man is on the throne. When we think about Calvary, it may seem that the death of the Lord Jesus was a defeat. It was actually a stunning victory for him and it was the death blow to the devil. The Savior said that if a corn of wheat does not fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. But if it is planted, if it dies, it produces much fruit. By dying, the Lord Jesus made possible the salvation of untold 
billions of people who were once enslaved by Satan and ruined by sin. When David defeated Goliath, he used the giant's own sword to slay him. Christ took the enemy's chief weapon, death, and by dying, he actually dealt a death blow to the devil. Think of the D-Day invasion, whose anniversary we just observed. The enemy still fought and fought hard. But in retrospect now, we can see that his doom was sealed once the Allies successfully landed and defeated him at the beaches. Similarly, the devil is still fighting, and he's fighting hard. But his doom is sealed and will be made public and apparent when Christ returns. Calvary has ensured that right will triumph and that wrong will be vanquished. Simply put, Christ is going to win. And you would be wise to make sure that you are on the winning side by having that blessed Savior as your personal Savior. Christ's death has procured life. The reason that the Bible says that eternal life is the gift of God is because Christ paid for that gift at Calvary. Religions all over the world and all through time have suggested that the only way to obtain eternal life is by what you do or what you pay or what you suffer or what you sacrifice. Generally, it entails your being faithful to whatever they tell you to do. But the Bible says the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life. In fact, the end of that verse reads this, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It was the Nobel laureate Milton Friedman who coined the saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's now a common English dictum, no such thing as a free lunch. He was pointing out, of course, that whenever something is free, it might be free to you, but it costs somebody else. Somebody else paid for it in order for it to be free to you. Because of what the Lord Jesus has done for you at Calvary, you can have eternal life today. It is a gift to be accepted, not a grace to be earned. It is not bought by you. It is bestowed on you as a gift by God. It is something that is to be received, not achieved. It is a gift. It is by grace. It is through faith. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, unlike other gifts, which are either unwanted or on the they're the wrong size or they're duplicates of something you already have, this gift is supremely prized by everyone who has it. No one ever repents of salvation on a deathbed. No one ever comes to the end of the road and says, I'm sorry that I trusted Christ. Salvation and eternal life, they not only make life worth living, but it robs death of its bitterest sting. No one wants to leave family or friends. But for a believer, salvation ensures that one moment beyond death, that child of God is at home in heaven forever. While he was a patient at Groat Shore Hospital in Cape Town, South Africa, Philip Blayberg, who was himself a doctor, was the recipient of a new heart through the skill of the surgeon Christiane Barnard. There was a moment when that courageous patient, because heart transplant surgery was very new at the time, there was a moment when that courageous patient met for the first time the woman who had given him life. She was the one who gave the permission for surgeons to remove the heart of her dead husband so that Philip Blayberg could live. This is what Dr. Blayberg asked. What does one say in such circumstances? She lost a life. I had gained one. Do you sense his words and the humble gratitude in his words? That's how it is with salvation. Christ sacrificed his life so that I could have eternal life, so that billions of people could have eternal life. And that gift is supremely prized by everyone that has it. I have something that cost God his son. I have something that cost Christ his life. You'll understand how much I value it. This gift is suited perfectly to your deepest needs for this life and for eternity. God is the fountain of living waters. He alone 
can satisfy the gnawing emptiness that sin has created in every unredeemed heart, the, the emptiness that's there because God has been deposed and sin has come in. Our fears of the future and the uncertainties of eternity are removed by this wonderful gift that brightens not only the dark days of life, but the darkest day of death. It is suited perfectly to meet your needs for this life. And it is singularly precious to everyone that has it. Salvation is not more of the same. It's not merely something better than what you have. It is not a copy or even a better version of what you now possess. It is unique. It is singular. It will bring peace to your heart. It will bring the confidence and assurance to your soul that your future is secure. I have a dear friend who came to America from Haiti some years ago, and he began attending a Lutheran church. For two years, he attended catechism classes at that church. The pastor told him that he should be baptized, and he was. He started asking questions about sin, about eternity, about heaven and hell. The pastor told him that since he had been baptized, he was in God's family and was going to heaven. But he asked, what if I continue sinning? The pastor said that that was why he needed to come to church on Sunday so he could have his sins forgiven. So my friend, being something more of a deeper thinker than that, said, but what if I die before Sunday? And he was told that God, who knows the future, would know whether he was really going to go on Sunday. And so, of course, somehow that would already be accredited to his account. But he began to read the Bible with all of these questions in his mind. And he found out that God's way of salvation through Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, was far different from what he was being told. He realized he did not have a moment in his life when he was saved. Do you have a moment in your life when you were saved? One night, deeply concerned about his future, he admitted to God that if the Bible were true, that he, he himself, was on the way to hell and he couldn't do anything about it. He said, I was reading Romans chapter 3 and I realized that what I was looking for, that righteousness, salvation, that comes through faith in the Lord Jesus. And he described that night this way. November the 30th, 2001, was the best night of my life. Above all, I thank the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, for paying the price I could not pay. Paying the price I could not pay. We could never have afforded this priceless gift of eternal life, but it is being offered as a gift because Christ paid for it with his precious blood. His resurrection, the Savior's resurrection, provides assurance. The Lord Jesus was delivered up to the death of the cross because of our sins. The Bible says he was raised up from the dead because of our justification. God testified to the finality, perfection, and completeness of his son's work by raising him from the dead. The empty tomb not only proves that Christ lives, it also proves that all who trust in him will live with him forever. Now please follow this clear logic, this biblical truth that I'm about to enunciate. If the Lord Jesus bore my sins on the tree, on the cross at Calvary, and if God raised him from the dead and brought him back to heaven where sin cannot enter, then where are my sins? The Bible's answer is that Christ put away my sin by the sacrifice of himself, that he blotted them out, that he purged my sins. This is why the Bible states that the blood of Jesus Christ, not your tears, not your prayers, not your baptism, not your church attendance, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. His ascension proves that he will return. The Lord Jesus told his disciples, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also. When he ascended, the disciples who were watching him rise from their midst were told by a messenger, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus whom you have seen taken up from you into heaven 
shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. The ascension of the Lord Jesus back to the heaven from which he came is one of the fundamentals of the Christian faith. It's part of what may have been an early Christian hymn recorded in Paul's letter to Timothy when he said Christ was received up into glory. We may not think of the ascension as much or as often as we do of the crucifixion or even the resurrection, but think of what it means. The man that the world rejected has been received by heaven. Peter, the apostle, preached that the heavens must receive him. He is the son of God. Of course, heaven had to receive him. God was thrilled to welcome Christ home after the great battle and victory of Calvary. He has gone into heaven as a man, taking his stainless and sinless humanity into the presence of his father. The Bible says he is appearing in the presence of God for his people. And he has taken his place on the Father's throne, awaiting the day when his Father will place him on his own throne in this world. Many great women and men have lived and died. Religious leaders and mighty monarchs have come and gone. Just one man, just one man, died for the world, ascended to heaven, and sat himself down on the throne of God. How wise! Is the woman or man, girl or boy, how wise is the person who trusts the safety and salvation of her or his soul to this mighty, eternal Son of God, the Savior of sinners? In 2013, a new word was accepted into the Oxford English Dictionary. The word is FOMO, F-O-M-O, -O, FOMO. That is a shorthand acronym for fear of missing out, FOMO. Of all the things to fear, fear this. Fear missing out on God's great gift of eternal life. Fear missing out on his great salvation. Fear missing out on knowing Christ as your Savior. Make sure this day that you have personally trusted the Savior who loved you and died for you and who says to us in unmistakable words, I am the way. You want to know the way to heaven? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Thank you very much for listening. We'll pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we give thanks for the Savior who came and died and rose and lives, for a message of good news that tells how we too, whether having to face death or not, can be with him forever in heaven. We thank thee that the Bible tells us he that believes on the Son has everlasting life. And we pray that this night souls will believe on Christ trusting him as Savior, and receive this great gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Accept our thanks in his worthy and precious name. Amen. Now again, I remind you that there is no meeting tomorrow evening, but God willing, Sunday through Friday, at this same time, 7 p.m., the gospel will be preached here in the Newington Gospel Hall. Thank you again.